Welcome back to the Business of Biotech. I'm Matt Piller, and on today's show, we're talking with the CEO of a biopharma startup conceived in a most unique way. It's seeds having been planted and fertilized by a patient advocacy organization. My guest is Dr. Ben Yerksa, who, after earning his PhD in biologic chemistry at UC Irvine, tallied up a number of industry leadership roles, including EVP and Chief of R&D at Inspire Pharmaceuticals, VP of Product Development at Parion Sciences, VP of R&D at Clearside Biomedical, Chief Scientific Officer at Liquidia Technologies, and President and CEO at Invisia Therapeutics. Dr. Yerk is also uh, an active board member serving at Nacuity Pharmaceuticals, at Cena Therapeutics, and Sparing Vision, whose CEO, by the way, Stefan Boissel, was a recent guest on this very podcast. Today, Dr. Yerksa is a triple CEO. He serves as CEO at Foundation Fighting Blindness, the CEO of its Retinal Degeneration Fund, and CEO at newly formed biotech Opus Genetics. Now, these are three closely intertwined organizations whose relationships to one another we will reveal today during our discussion. Dr. Yerksa, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. Uh, any corrections to my, my, my intro? Did I get all that pretty much uh, on point? It's all good, although I'm no longer a board member of Vetsina. I relinquished that board position recently. Oh, come on. I mean, you felt like you needed to get something off your plate. You didn't have any extra room on your on your plate having, uh, you know, serving three CEO roles? <laughs> Busy times, but I'm on a mission. Nice. I want to start, we're going to get into that, uh, you know, the, the, the three CEO, CEO role um, conversation here shortly, but I want to start with uh, getting some some background on, on how Opus Genetics came to pass. As I said, uh, a company formed up in a very unique way, spun out just last year by the Retinal Degeneration Fund, which is the venture arm of the Foundation Fighting Blindness, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. give, us, give us some detail on how and why the company formed up. Right. So Opus Genetics really evolved out of three years of observation and a little bit of frustration, frankly, from the point of view of the Foundation Fighting Blindness, because we found that there were a number of gene therapies that had been developed with great science and that were ready to be you know, translated into the clinic, but they weren't being picked up by the biotechs. They weren't being financed by Main Street Venture Capital, and they're just getting kind of kicked around. And part of the reason for that is that these were addressing some of the smaller populations. So basically, it didn't work commercially if you thought about these as individual assets or even as one or two of them. So we formed Opus Genetics to develop a business model uh, that would basically take in all of these that have good science, they're ready to go. But when you develop them as a stack, when you have say three or four products or even five or six, then actually the commercial piece gets really interesting even though you're going after smaller populations. Mm -hmm. But there were a few things we realized along the way as we developed that, that, that model. One was we're going to have to be fast and efficient in how we do it because these are smaller populations, smaller commercial opportunities. So the speed and cost of development has to be better than what we've seen in the past. And one of the important linchpins is manufacturing. I'm sure we'll talk about that later, but it's sort of like small scale boutique manufacturing is a really important component of what we're doing at Opus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely will. I've got a, I've got a litany, a, a slew of questions for you on, on, on manufacturing, um, but, but I want to kind of dwell on the, on the model here a, a little bit longer. I, you know, I, one of the things that intrigued me about um, having you on the show and discussing this is the fact that you know the, the, the company was born of a, um, a patient advocacy type organization. And, and I've seen similar models like the venture philanthropy sort of model. Not, not too long ago, listeners will recall that I had Katie Eli, uh, Elias, that is, on from um, the T1D Fund, which is the venture philanthropy arm of the Juvenile uh, Diabetes Research Foundation. Um, you know, in their model, they sort of, you know, they, they don't, they obviously didn't form a, 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 a biopharma or a biotech company that has a, a pipeline of candidates, but they dangle carrots in front of companies that they believe you know, do have uh, the potential to um, address type one diabetes 
uh, in, in their pipeline. Um, now, in your case, so the the, the retinal degeneration, degeneration fund actually launched this this biopharma Opus to address the needs of its patient constituents. Um, what would you say, like coming out of that that uh, so, sort of genesis story? What, what what has that formed in terms of the unique maybe attributes or advantages of your company that maybe you wouldn't see in a in a biopharma that's um, that, that's that's founded and funded in a more traditional way. Right. So let me start with a little bit of sort of how we got here from the fund perspective, because our approach has actually evolved over time. Um, and, you know, the short answer is that we fund with blended approaches. So the RD fund is perfectly happy to do a project co-funding kinds of deals where we do go to, a, say, a public company and say, Hey, if we split the cost 50-50 from preclinical to phase two, um, you know, will you, will you make that your next IND filing? And that's a deal we do with Procure, for example. Mm -hmm. And that was a very effective way for us to use our, our muscle and our dollars to help move the priorities within, you know, bigger companies' pipelines, right? So that's one style. The other style is equity and ground floor equity, you know, where you have a lot of influence. You come in, you're actually there in the formative times of the company, uh, and you not only sort of help put funding to certain projects, but you also can influence which teams are coming into the company. And we typically, if we make a sizable investment, we take board seats. So we're very active, we're hands-on. But the benefit is when we do an equity investment like that, that company gets the full benefit of the resources of the foundation behind it to help with probability of success and, and so on and so forth. So what does that mean? That's things like access to our patient registry, super helpful in enrolling clinical trials in the rare disease world. Mm -hmm. um, we have a clinical consortium with the top 40 to 50 clinical sites around the world, you know, tapping into that infrastructure for enrolling in clinical trials. Um, and for some of these companies, even future pipeline, because we fund, say, 80 or 90 labs projects around the country at any given time, that's a source of future pipeline that we can channel into these companies over time so they can continue to develop in the field. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you, uh, do you see this as, do you think this is sort of a, 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 I don't know, novel, like super unique approach? Or are, you, are you maybe seeing a wider trend of this approach kind of taking hold? I think what I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot more interest, but the, the number of foundations that actually pull the trigger on venture philanthropy is still reasonably small. So it's a very hot topic. Um, but my view on this is that you have to be a reasonably sized organization to really be able to be good at venture philanthropy because you, you need to have more than just one project you want to do. You know, typically you, should, you need to spread out your risk. Otherwise, you know, you're really... Um, you know, it's, it's tough business investing in biotech in general. So it's better to have a portfolio in our view. Um, but a lot of boards just, they like the idea, but when it comes down to it, they just get really nervous about it. So I actually try to talk, talk to people in the field and just try to demystify, you know, this venture philanthropy uh, idea because the nuts and bolts are not that complicated, but you do need to have staff and the right people that can actually manage the process after you pull the trigger, you don't just throw it over the fence. You just, you got to be more involved. So yeah. um, now maybe I could clarify one thing about Opus as well sure. is that Opus is the first example of where we've been allowed via a, a tweak to our charter for fund two that we can actually lead investments and do new company creation. Oh. In our first, you know, 10 investments we did mostly through fund one, um, we could co-lead or follow, but we couldn't really take the lead and, and start a new company. So this is our first time doing it. It's our largest investment, a $10 million initial investment. Normally we're two to $5 million. Mm -hmm. So Opus was really, uh, you know, it was a big step for the foundation to be, to be that hands-on and that, uh, had that much conviction, frankly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. And, and as I said, we'll get into the candidates and the manufacturing here shortly, but I want to, I want to, um, having, having set up sort of the foundation there, I want to talk about you a little bit. Um, first of all, as you're, as I'm sitting here, you know, looking at you on, on the, on the computer screen, 
it, it occurs to me, you know, I, as I mentioned, uh, not too long ago, I interviewed Stefan Boissel from uh, yeah. Spectrum Vision, whose who's board, who's board you sit on. And, uh, you know, so again, uh, you know, uh, an uh, ophthalmic uh, or, or ocular therapy company. And it occurred to me while I was talking to him that he, he's got great eyes. And as I sit here looking at you, Ben, I mean, you, you have great eyes. Is that like prerequisite to work in, in your space? You have to have uh, great eyes. Your eyes look vibrant and healthy. Well, thank you. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Thank you. <laughs> um, but but ocular disease. I mean, if you you know, uh, ocular health and ocular disease uh, has that been a common thread like throughout your your career? You, as I as I rambled on in in the uh, in the intro, you know, I kind of ran through some of your experiences and the places that you've worked, and I know some of them have do, do have you know retinal uh, programs. But it, it, can can you kind of look back and uh, and see an ocular uh, kind of focus on your on your career? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I um... It all started when I was working on cystic fibrosis at a company called Inspire. I started out working on HIV at Burroughs Welcome, which is a great training ground, but got into um, you know, this area of sort of mucosal hydration, you know, to hydrate the lungs and try to have a treatment for cystic fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And I was a project leader for a new compound that was going towards IND filing. And I literally just came up with some random idea of, well, what if there are other mucous membranes in the body that could be you know, hydrate using this approach. And I thought about the eye and started researching it and realized that the same mechanisms were there, the same chloride channels, the same mucins, all this sort of mucosal protection that's in the lung is the same at play in the eye. And um, I brought it up in a board meeting and, you know, the pulmonologist like threw tomatoes at me, like we're a lung company, you know, who's this kid talking about the eye? But we had uh, our chairman of the board at the time was Leigh Thompson, former CSO for Eli Lilly. And he had heard of Sjogren's syndrome, which is a really awful dry eye, dry mouth uh, kind of syndrome. And so I got the support to actually go to Arvo, the big eye research conference, a couple hundred thousand dollars to do some proof of concept. And all of a sudden I was this project leader for this you know, nascent eye program. And I just kept learning about the eye and going on. And eventually, you know, that program actually went all the way into phase three in the US. Uh, it's an approved product in Japan. And um, I just fell in love with the eye. It's sort of like a microcosm of the body. You know, it's like, it's got yeah. neuro, it's got immuno, it's got neuromuscular, it's got, you know, all these different aspects to it. So I love it. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. And, and back in, in your UC Irvine days uh, in studying biochem or earning that PhD, uh, the, the eye, was, it's not like a, it, it wasn't, wasn't seeded uh, back then. It kind of came. No, no, yeah. it's really pretty much a hardcore chemist. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, so today at, at Opus, well, you know, before I get to this, I want, I want to ask you uh, a, a question I hadn't planned on asking until we started talking about this kind of triple role CEO uh, position that you have and, and, the, and, and sort of how it came to pass. And, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, if it's going to offend any of your constituents. But I'm curious, uh, serving these three roles, the most recent of them, I believe, being Opus, and that role sort of being, I don't know if I'd, use, I, you know, you, you tell me, I don't know if I'd use the word, you know, th thrust upon you or expected of you uh, or, or a sort of necessary for you to take. Um, but which, which are the roles, you know, the uh, Foundation Fighting Blindness, uh, the, the RD Fund, uh, the Opus Genetics, which, which are the roles um, do you, I guess, embrace uh, most wholeheartedly and which of them are you perhaps more anxious to uh, <laughs> usher in a successor. I mean, is, is that something you can address? Yeah, look, I, I think, um, you know, the reality is for someone like me in, in the sort of leadership position, um, overseeing different parts of the organization, um, I think someone described it recently as, as peanut buttering, you know? So mm. a lot of what I have to do is, is go where the action is, you know, solve problems, and then move on to the next problem. And so if the RD fund is smooth sailing, you know, we've got a great staff, you know, uh, Rusty Kelly's full-time for the RD fund, managing the investments. If he doesn't need my help, then he doesn't get my time. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I've got Jason Menzo as president of the foundation. He's doing a fantastic job managing the largest portion of our staff. You know, if he doesn't have any problems, then he doesn't need my time either. So. 
Uh, and the same goes for Opus. You know, we've got a great initial team, chief operating officer, chief scientific officer, a new manufacturing hire. Um, so basically what I do is I just move from one to the other as needed. And the only time it gets tricky is if everything's bubbling up with all three at the same time. Okay, mm -hmm. then, then it gets tricky, right? But that's, that's a pretty rare occurrence. So I love working in all three environments. They're all working on the same mission. Um, it's just a slightly different flavor. So, you know, managing the foundation is one kind of, you know, sort of constituent centric, you know, donor centric, but also very science heavy. The foundation is basically an R&D shop, which mm -hmm. I love. So I'm managing a huge R&D portfolio. The RD fund is a, it's a smaller portfolio, but they're bigger bets, the multi-million dollar bets on two handfuls of things that we have really big conviction on. And then Opus Genetics is sort of like this new baby that's been born that we're just trying to grow up and get more funding for, but collecting assets where there's high unmet medical need and amazing science. So to me, it's like, it's all part of the blend. Uh, and I just do my best to, to not get overwhelmed and, um, yeah, just take a deep breath every now and then. Yeah, yeah. Well, if if you hadn't done such a lovely job answering that question that I just threw at you out of left field, I would accuse you of uh, taking the political a, a political response, but um, you know, by, by not answering which one you'd be most likely to give up. But I'm not accusing you of that because it makes perfect sense. I mean, that was a it was a you know good good, good thorough response. Thank you. Yeah, you're now developing AAV-based gene therapies at, at Opus uh, for ne neglected forms of inherited blindness, beginning with your lead program, OPGX001, uh, to address uh, Lieber congenital amaurosis. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Yeah. So tell, so tell us about that program. Uh, you know, you just mentioned, you know, a asset collection being one of the most exciting parts or one of the certainly the exciting parts of, of the Opus genetics role. Um, tell us about that lead program. Yeah, so this is a program that uh, was developed at University of Pennsylvania under Jean Bennett's guidance. And if you know about Jean Bennett, you know, she's, you know, one of the, the big, you know, proponents behind Luxterna, the first gene therapy approved in our country. Mm -hmm. And you know, she published a, an important paper in 2018 showing that in LCA5, so Libra congenital amaurosis number five, very rare, severe pediatric disease where kids go blind in their first decade of life, certainly the first few years of life, they're very visually impaired. Uh, she found that in a faithful mouse model, they could restore both structure and function. It was a really remarkable result. Mm -hmm. Now the hitch here, going back to the Opus model, is that there are only a few hundred patients in the United States, you know, less than a thousand US Europe combined. So yeah. this is a small population. But she figured it out. And so we're really excited to, to bring this in the clinic. Actually, the ideal will be filed in maybe you know, one to two months. So we're mm -hmm. really right on the verge of getting this in the clinic. But the interesting thing here is that this program has what we call structure function dissociation. So that's where patients go into several decades of life, in their second and third decades of life, where they still have retinal structure. They're, they're very, they're legally blind, but they still have their photoreceptors intact in the eye. They're struggling, they're hanging on, but they're there to be rescued by gene therapy. So we believe there's a real opportunity here to have uh, an effective treatment, potentially a cure, where we can treat people as late as their second or third decade of life, even though they've probably been blind since they were five. Mm. So, you know, again, that's where the science matters. You know, these nuances of the clinical course, how well the gene therapy works, uh, all that. You can do as much, you know, do the best work you can in animals, but eventually you got to get into people and see if it really rings true. So we're excited about this first program, even though it is a relatively small opportunity. Yeah. 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 That is exciting. Um, and, and, and despite the size of the opportunity, I'm interested in the, uh, you know, manufacturing and, and scale approach. So and you, the, the question that I have for you around that is, is, uh, this is a direct quote, I think, from perhaps your site. Uh, you described the company as a patient-first, science-driven gene therapy company, tackling manufacturing obstacles, standing in the way of treatments for ultra-rare blinding conditions. Um, the words there that I want to I want to ask you about are the the manufacturing obstacles uh, that stand in the way of of developing these treatments. Um, 
what have what what have they been like? What have those manufacturing obstacles looked like as 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 Opus formed up? You know, as as you move towards formation of this company, knowing full well that uh, you know for the first time you'd be putting ten million dollars into the into a company that's designed to construct these things. What did you know was ahead of you in terms of manufacturing obstacles? Yeah, so we'd seen um, over the years from the vantage point of the foundation and even the R&D fund with our portfolio companies that the, the first obstacle is simply just time and money because the seed the contract manufacturers are very busy and they've got bigger clients who need bigger batches of material. Mm-hmm. And what's happening is literally you have to put down a multi-million dollar deposit just to get your place in line to wait a year to a year and a half to make a batch of material that costs millions of dollars. And if there's a mistake, and if that material is not good and you need to go back and rework the batch, you get to the back of the line. And it's, it happens fairly frequently. <laughs> and so the, the, the cost and the time component is awful. It's very, very frustrating. And the problem with, with the retina programs is that you know, the doses are very small, so the volumes are small. So for example, uh, you know, one vial, of gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy could treat 5,000 retinas or more. That's Mm. the kind of difference we're talking about. So we're coming in with smaller volume programs to these big CDMOs that are looking for the bigger dollars. So we're always kind of lower priority. And and, they'll never tell you that, but it's just kind of, it's economics, right? So the first thing we're doing is, since we don't have anything built, right? We have to work with some kind of contract you know, outfit to get the job done. So we're, we're close to signing and announcing a really creative partnership with a great CDMO that believes in our model, that understands what we need and how to do it, uh, has worked out a, a great framework for us to work together on multiple programs. At the end of the day, this is boutique manufacturing. This is like 50 liter batches, not 500 or 5,000 liters. Mm-hmm. You know, you could run a batch almost in the size of my office. You know, it's it's not huge equipment. It's not a giant room stainless steel. So that that's that's one. And I think then the other things are just a little more specific, like how pure is your product? You know, there have been some setbacks in gene therapy, and you know, people are scratching their heads. Well, sometimes people inject the body with product that's only 70% full capsids and 30% are empty virus, you know, or it can be even worse than that, mm-hmm. you know, have pure material. If you have smaller batches, it's easier to purify and repurify to get to that higher, tighter, you know, higher purity. Um, you're not reworking this gigantic batch. So th- that's the kind of stuff we're working on so that when we go in, we've got the highest probability of success and a reasonable cost of goods. When you're striving to excel in a new arena, the best guides are the ones already doing it well. The business of biotech brings those voices forward to help new and emerging biopharmas turn their innovations like mRNA and cell and gene therapies into clinical realities. Tune in and subscribe for insights on hiring, regulatory, and other need to know topics for biopharma leaders. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with Cytiva. Check out their resources at Cytiva.com backslash Emerging Biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A dot com backslash Emerging Biotech. Uh, so I, w- I want to back up to the, the first one that you mentioned, um, you know, around the, the CDMO. Uh, f- first of all, can you, can, you, can you share with us which CDMO that is or is it too? Not yet, not yet. Okay. Not a problem. Um, so the, the second question there being, why not do it yourself? To your point, like you don't need a multi, you know, multi-million dollar infrastructure investment, real estate, you know, giant, great, great big giant facility. Right. Why, not, why not just, uh, why not do it yourself? Well, that's part of our long-term ambition, you know, mm-hmm. assuming that it still makes sense at that time. Uh, we have immediate needs we have to take care of. So we had, we were forced, you know, to, to work with the CDMO at the outset, but it's really important that we have portability. So that was one of our deal killer kind of walk away things and talking to multiple CDMOs, we had to have portability because down the road, if we have say six products, um, even less than that, Mm -hmm. it's probably gonna make sense for us to have our own manufacturing site that just specializes in this type of small scale manufacturing. You just need enough products to keep a facility like that fully busy. Otherwise it becomes a money pit. (laughs) 
Yeah. Um, but you're right. We won't have to make an announcement. Hey, a new RTP company building a $120 million manufacturing plant. You know, it's going to be much, much smaller than that. Uh, and we'll still be able to do the job. Yeah. As you look out, and, and I'll give you an opportunity um, here in a, in a couple of minutes to talk about your other uh, pre-clinical programs and, and, okay. and clinical programs, if, if there are any other uh, programs heading into the clinic. But um, just to touch on that real quick, looking out at your pipeline and, and, and potential pipeline over the next several years, do any of the candidates that you might anticipate bringing on present opportunities for larger patient populations and therefore larger uh, batches and, and bigger, um, you know, bigger facilities needs? Or do you anticipate that the company will remain focused on ultra rare, small patient populations and therefore smaller manufacturing runs? There's a two so, it hard to say. Yeah, no. So that's a fair question. So there's a range of opportunities. So everything we're doing is going to be rare. Question of, is it rare, ultra rare, or really, really ultra rare? So, mm -hmm. you know, what we're talking about, I think a good way to frame it is we're looking at uh, programs where the populations are, say, half the size of the external population, like LCA5, to twice the size of that, and maybe three to four or five times the size of that. So low hundreds to low thousands of patients is sort of our sweet spot. Um, we're probably not gonna be getting into conditions where there's tens of thousands of patients. Mm -hmm. That okay. makes sense. So that's, that's yeah. kind of the range of possibility we're looking at. So whether that means it's strictly a 50 liter reactor or you, know, you need to go up into something a little bit bigger, TBD, I think a couple of the programs we're looking at are fairly healthy populations. Mm -hmm. um, but it may just, we may just be able to make more frequent batches as opposed to increasing the batch size. That's TBD. Okay. All right. Great. Um, you mentioned also when we started talking about manufacturing, you mentioned, uh, you know, tighter challenges and, 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 um, and purity, um, residual uh, virus. Are, are those are, are the, the, the challenges related uh, to, to that element specific to the AAV, the, the, the AAV, the, the, the vector of choice, or, or I guess, uh, give, me, give me some color around what specific challenges the AAV approach uh, presents. Yeah, I think some of these challenges are pretty common amongst all gene therapy. So, and I'm not a total expert on that, you know, specific issue, but Mm -hmm. It has generally been common in AVs, you know, whether it's AV two, five, eight, nine, whatever, that there's always a component of full to empty, you know, as a ratio that people are striving towards. And in early development, it's sometimes a challenge to, to get that number as, as high as you would like it. Um, part of what we're trying to do at Opus, which I should have mentioned earlier, is that we want to work with the capsids that are very well characterized, that are sort of tried and true. So we're not going after new capsids that require two years of development and scale up or only working with capsids that are already known to be able to be scaled, uh, for example. So trying to keep it really simple in that regard. Um, but, but yeah, we're sort of dealing with common issues associated with a variety of AV manufacturing challenges. Yeah. Okay. What would you say, um, you know, beyond uh, your, your own clinical effort, um, what would you say would be the paradigm change that um, you'd like to see Opus create in the greater industry? I mean, it, you know, and the question, I don't know if, I don't know if, if I would characterize it as, I don't know. It, I, I guess that question is born of your origin, right? Like Opus um, comes out of a, 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 a patient advocacy organization and a, and a fund that, you know, heretofore the approach would be agnostic, if you will, right? Like we're gonna we're gonna rally support from any source to go right. out and, ta and tackle this thing. Um, so now you create a, a a bio a biotech company from that that's developing a pipeline. I would only imagine that there's a greater you know be, beyond your own uh, market opportunity and mission to to help these patients. Uh, there's maybe a greater impact you guys want to leave in terms of the way that these therapies are, 
are gone about uh, being produced. So I, I guess maybe tell me if that's true. And if so, like what, what the greater impact from a, a manufacturing perspective might, might look like. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that if you develop a product and there's not clear widespread access to that product that you failed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that as we get successful in getting things over the finish line, we have to be really thoughtful about how we work with payers, how we get these therapies to patients who are not in the US and Europe, you know, the ones that, that sort of pay the most, you know, how do we find an equitable way to get access? Because this is a genetic lottery. These patients are everywhere around the world. So wherever you see large populations, you're gonna see more patients essentially with some exceptions. But uh, so we've gotta be really thoughtful about that. And so cost of goods and efficiency in manufacturing Manufacturing is, is absolutely key. You know, you've got to be able to make it in a way that uh, you, you can provide this precious tiny little vial <laughs> and get it to the right doctors and the right patient in a way that makes sense and that, that the world can kind of understand the value of. So, you know, we're prepared to have those conversations as we go. And, um, you know, we'll be blazing a trail. Some of these, you know, these treatments are going to be you know, we're going to be the only company in the world that's even taken a shot at these. And so uh, it's the only chance these patients are going to have for a treatment or a cure. So we've got to be practical about the access piece. Um, you know, I'm not sure else how, how else to answer the question, but it, it, it's really important that, I mean, the dream is, for example, and there's 280 genes and counting that are already known to cause retinal blindness. Okay, so going gene by gene, you know, that's a long march. <laughs> okay, yeah. but we're getting started because the science is there for the first half a dozen or more. Uh, but as more and more of these become viable, when someone comes to us and say, well, what about my gene? We want to be able to say, well, yeah, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a way. Let's, let's figure it out. That's yeah. the dream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on, on that note, you know, to, to, uh, to achieve the dream, you need the team <laughs> to use a terrible cliche. Yeah. Team, team work makes the dream work. And you recently added to your team, you know, no, no pressure as we sit here and talk about changing the manufacturing paradigm, no pressure on, on Brian, your new VP of manufacturing. There. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell, tell us about that though. Not, not just in, not just in the context of Brian Lysing, uh, your new VP of manufacturing, um, but also the, the general strategy around building out the team of such a, a a, a young company, a new company, what, starting with Brian, why, why would you, would you consider that a strategic uh, appointment at this juncture in your, in your manufacturing and, and preclinical journey? And then beyond that, like what, what does the rest of the HR build out look like near term? Yeah. Yeah. So Brian, you know, the VP of uh, manufacturing, very key early hire, um, super competitive market. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, right now there's a war on talent in general, but in gene therapy, it's like even up an order of magnitude. Yeah. So one of our, you know, one thing we're grateful for is being here in RTP, North Carolina, which is kind of a hotbed for gene therapy manufacturing. So it was a great talent pool to, to draw from. And, you know, fortunate enough to get someone like Brian with his experience to come in, you know, to, you know, he's basically uh, employee number three, um, and, uh, you know, uh, a fledgling company trying to get his first program into the clinic and, you know, left a really nice job to do that because he believes in the mission. And that's, that's sort of like, that's our secret weapon, right? Is that what we're doing and how we do it is really attractive to key talent. But there's a long way to answer your question. Um, you know, we talked a lot about manufacturing being key. And if we didn't have a person on board in manufacturing, we'd kind of be a little bit of a hypocrite, you know, I mean, it's key to nail the manufacturing piece because you can't get into the clinic without clean material. I mean, it's no. what we say in this business is the process is the product. So you've got to get the process down because that's what you're putting into people. So Brian's a key hire for sure. But, you know, in a startup, really what we need is we need 50% of 12 people's time. You know, so it's, it's hard to find that. You, know, you can't hire 12 people from day one. So we need to hire people that I call athletes, people that can really, you know, do many different things at once. Uh, so our chief operating officer, Joe Shackle, actually we worked together at Inspire for 10 years. So 
he's almost like a brother to me. We, we were at adjacent offices for, for 10 years. Um, and so he and I are, are in sync on all this kind of operational stuff. I heard Ash Jacobal as chief scientific officer, 15 years in retinal research and industry and academia, jumped right in, super enthusiastic. But then we, and then plus Brian, but then we leveraged the team with external consultants and advisors who are content experts, but we only need them for 10, 15 hours a week. And so that's how we extend the team as we grow. And then we'll hire people one by one over time, we'll make a couple more key hires this year. And then we want to raise another big round of money, actually, uh, hopefully closing in sometime this summer. And once we do that, then we'll be on a bigger growth pattern. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And, and I could see where not only would, uh, you know, you, you've got a double whammy there as, as far as hiring is concerned, because yes, you know, to your point, there's this giant uh, talent, talent crunch. It, it's, you know, incredibly competitive. Um, but also because of the very unique uh, manufacturing environment and manufacturing outlook of your company. I mean, to your point, yeah. you, you just said, you just said a few minutes ago that, you know, at, at some point in our company's progression, we, we will more than likely be the only company in the world addressing specific indications with specific therapies. Right. Um, it takes a special person to fill that role, right? Like you don't go to Brian and say, Hey, how would you like to order, you know, oversee a 350,000 square feet of biomanufacturing space? <laughs> if that's what he, if that's what he's after, you know, he's a, he's definitely not a, not a good fit for Opus. So, uh, you know, I'm sure you, you not only do you have to be very selective, but uh, you also face that talent crunch that everyone else is dealing with right now. Yeah, yeah. For someone like Brian, for example, you know, he's sort of already done the big facility thing. He's mm -hmm. actually really intrigued with doing something that's a little more, you know, down to earth for what Opus needs and is attracted to that. And to do it knowing everything he knows now from the beginning, you know, so it's a really intriguing possibility for someone like Brian to kind of start with a white piece of paper. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Um, so I'm going to, in the time we have left here, I want to, uh, as I said, talk a little bit about some other preclinical programs that are in the works at Opus, if, if you'd like to, but also sure. you, you mentioned, um, you know, you mentioned a, another round of, of funding coming up. Uh, you're more than welcome to talk about that a little bit too, what your, what your strategy might be there uh, in, in terms of your, your next uh, financing round and, and what you're uh, hoping to be able to do with uh, that next round. Your choice. Yeah. yeah, yeah get, no, I, choice. <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's uh, it's a good topic actually, because we decided to, you know, the JP Morgan conference is virtual. We decided to kind of get out there and at least introduce Opus to a lot of funds that we know are interested in ophthalmology and gene therapy and some of the strategics in this space and getting a really nice reception. You know, a lot of people are really interested in what we're doing. Uh, so we're actually going to crank up our process to do a full Series A. Uh, we'd like to close that this year. Uh, we're working off our seed financing, which is a $19 million seed. Um, and we've got plenty of cash to get through really the first quarter of next year. Mm -hmm. um, but it's much easier to raise money when you have money. And we want to give uh, these funds plenty of time to do their diligence and not rush the process. Um, but the, the opportunity here is that we're seeing real tangible assets we can bring into Opus for programs four, five, and six, mm -hmm. and maybe seven. Okay. And if that's the case, we will be limited by capital, not by the science. And so it's a, just a great opportunity to really create what we call the stack. Yep. And the way we want to do this is raise enough money to move the entire stack forward simultaneously with each program going as fast as it can on its own merits. That's the art of the game, and um, really exciting, you know. And yeah. so we're we're looking to raise seventy to one hundred million dollars um, later this year, maybe more. Wow, wow. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's aggressive. And no, it's a, it's it's perfect because we're we're addressing both of both of my uh, you know dealer dealers choice topics there, the funding and and the candidates. Um, you know, increasingly, I'm I'm curious about your 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 take on this. Increasingly, when I have conversations with um, fund raisers such as yourself and venture capitalists uh mm -hmm. who, who i also entertain on the show from time to time um you know we we increasingly we're talking about uh new levels of discernment in uh private equity 
and also the capital markets, right? But more yeah. so private equity around, you know, for the past, I don't know, since 2013, it's been easy to fund an idea or a piece of yeah. science, but yeah. there hasn't been a, hasn't been a giant expectation around, you know, um, that, that becoming uh, more a, a product. And, and we're shifting now to a more discerning environment where, uh, you know, there needs to be in, in your, in your uh, pitch, um, at least some something, some sort of data that points to the, the commercial, I don't, know, I don't know if I dare say commercialization, but productization, right? Like it, it's got sure, a sure. idea. Are, are you seeing that? So I, I use a lot of words there, but are, are, are you seeing that? And do you feel, um, do, you, do you feel as though Opus is, is well healed to, uh, you know, go, go out there and, 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 and face that, uh, I guess, shift in, in the private equity markets? Yeah, we were, you know, a little bit nervous, you know, starting in sort of mid-January with this conversation because the markets were terrible, right? We're hearing stories about funds just, you know, covering their public companies and, and kind of, you know, that kind of, you know, scary language. But the, the reality was that on the private side, um, the, the investors who really focus on the private side were very interested in the story because it is a product development story. It's a product development engine. It's not a platform of some new technology or new capsids. It's actually straightforward development of multiple products. And we explain that their investment does not hinge on a single clinical trial result because there's gonna be multiple results from multiple programs at any given time. They sort of take comfort in that portfolio approach. Because mm -hmm. um, as you know, many biotechs, they, they run up to a binary event and it's win, lose, you know, life or death. Right. We're not setting up Opus to be in that kind of boat. It's really going to be the whole stack. We'll probably have winners and losers because we're not immune to the odds of the industry. Um, sure. But we can we, we can reduce binary risk by having multiple programs. And I think that plays well to the investors. And we'll be clinically staged by the time we close this round. So they'll, we're not going to be a preclinical company at that time. Right, right. Yep. Awesome. Um, okay, so can you give any specifics pipeline wise, or, or perhaps even, uh, you know, reference a few other indications that you'll be pursuing? Or is it is it kind of too soon to, to go down that path? I mean, you just mentioned, you know, four, four to seven simultaneous marching onward and forward. Yeah. Uh, can, can you give us any uh, hints into what those four to seven additional programs might look like? Well, I can tell you about programs two and three. Okay. I have to yeah. be more obtuse about yeah, I the guess others. I, I guess I skipped right over those two, didn't I? I, I apologize. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. So program, the second program is uh, RDH-12. It's also a leader's congenital amaurosis, so pediatric blindness. Mm -hmm. This is actually an enzyme target. So it's a little bit more similar to Luxterna in terms of kind of the biology. And um, this will be in the clinic about a year from now. And uh, again, a population probably about twice the size of that for Lex Turner or RP65. So nice, healthy population. Um, again, really compelling biology, um, high med medical need. And uh, we have that structural functional dissociation also in this condition where uh, people with uh, RDH12 can go into their 20s, maybe even early 30s with retinal structure intact. Not perfect, but the cells are there so they can be rescued. So we're excited about that. That one also came from Gene Bennett's lab at the University of Pennsylvania. And then the third let program. Just, oh, let, let me just interrupt you real quick there. Just just super quick to make sure that I'm I'm clear on this. So this the structural functional differentiation uh, is is it safe to say that once the you know in situations where the structure is degraded beyond a certain point, there there's no, I mean there's there's no health or therapeutic effect. Yeah. But as long yeah. as there's some structural element to work with, it's sort of a scaffold to, to rebuild on, there is potential for therapeutic effect. Right. So we're, most of these targets we're going after are in the photoreceptor cells, so not the retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, yeah. So if you don't have photoreceptors, there's really nothing to rescue. There's no cell to receive the gene therapy. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks that's why that, that's really important. Um and then the third program we recently licensed from uh, Harvard Mass Eye and Ear from Eric Pierce's lab. Eric's a former head of our scientific advisory board at the foundation. So really, really strong career scientist in gene therapy and came up with uh, a treatment for NMN81 related, also an LCA. So another pediatric blinding disease. Uh, 
and that's a little bit behind RDH12. So it's a little bit, we have sort of a staggered start, but um, they're sort of neck and neck. Uh, and we're really excited about that third program. You know, what I want to say about programs four, five, six, seven, that we're looking at, that the next couple that we're looking at are not LCAs. So I don't want people to think that we're only a pediatric LCA based company. We are looking at other forms of retinitis pigmentosa and, you know, uh, later onset uh, types of uh, inherited retinal disease. So we're not just an LCA company. Yep. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll be, we'll be paying attention when, when uh, those programs are, are disclosed and, following along. I mean, and, you know, curious, curiously and, and hopeful. Um, it, it's an aggressive, aggressive goal, aggr aggressive fundraising goal and a aggress aggressive, uh, pipeline goal. Um, but, uh, you guys, you guys are, uh, it seems like you're making the right moves. Well, well suited to, uh, to pursue those goals. So, uh, we wish you luck and I, I thank you for coming on the show and sharing the story with us, Ben. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. My pleasure. Yeah. Hope to have you back. I'd love to. So that's Opus Genetics CEO, Dr. Ben Yerksa. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online in partnership with Cytiva, which demonstrates its commitment to new and emerging biotech at its virtual biotech accelerator at Cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. Check that out. Please go sign up for my newsletter at bioprocessonline.com. And if you like what you're hearing here on the podcast, subscribe to it, give us a review. And until next week, thanks for listening.